I've learned a lot from the sessions that we have just concluded. Uh, and there are three emerging macroeconomic uh, issues that uh, I would like to uh, focus on, uh, partly informed by that discussion and uh, partly colored by my immediate past uh, responsibility as a central bank governor. So um, I think the first issue is some worries about what's going to happen to aggregate demand in supporting growth, global growth, as the share of labor is declining, and we heard that from Kaushik today, uh, as labor saving technology and innovation is becoming very dominant, and also as inequality in sometimes within countries is also rising. Uh, we are used to taking for granted that as long as we supply, demand will be there, and demand is intermediated through what labor receives, because robots don't eat, robots don't wear clothes, is only humans, and once they receive income, is that's the way they also become part and parcel uh, of uh, uh, making sure that what is uh, <coughs> su supplied is also uh, demanded. Now, there was a very strong call for redistribution as a way of making sure that aggregate demand is still uh, keeping pace with the growth in productivity uh, and the growth in, uh, in output. Now, from a Caldorian sense, uh, we have always thought, you know, um, uh, higher savings and investment is always good for growth. Uh, that always assumed that demand uh, is not an issue, or at least it would have assumed the sales law, which is supply creates its own demand. Uh, but we know that uh, from the processes that we are experiencing now uh, regarding inequality and labor share uh, uh, decline, that that could be an issue. Now. It is important. A large part of the global value chain uh, developments that brought uh, Asian miracles uh, did not just benefit the Asians. Uh, it also benefited a number of our countries, including the commodity boom, uh, because we do feed into that production process. And it is only in looking at that interlinkage on a global scale, that uh, that concern for demand is as important uh, for China as it is for Tanzania. And I'm pleased also to note from the discussions we had that even the IMF now has also come to terms with the fact that, uh, in fact, two major findings which really grabbed me, sir, that lower net inequality drives faster and more durable growth. That's the finding they shared with us here. And that the combined direct and indirect effects of redistribution are pro-growth. And with that institution which seemed to be distant in relation to all the conversation that was happening elsewhere coming that close, uh, it gives me hope that uh, redistribution will uh, actually get back uh, to being 
a major issue. And it is, uh, as we know, uh, the UN SDGs, uh, as well as uh, Africa 2063, have all focused on inclusion as an important means to development, not just as an end. Number two is the challenges we are facing now with the end of QE. Uh, and first, of course, is exodus of uh, capital as it returns uh, to higher uh, rates, uh, both in US and in Europe. Um, and it also goes back uh, to uh, safety. Uh, of course, uh, developing countries still present a good, uh, if you want, destination in terms of returns, but certainly the end of QE has uh, put a major challenge, uh, and we are now forced to do fiscal consolidation, uh, and we are doing that sometimes prematurely. And of course, we are facing the challenges of debt uh, sustainability. Uh, and I wanted to focus particularly on uh, the issues that relate uh, to debt uh, uh, sustainability. First, it is, it is true that uh, um, during the time when everybody was enjoying quantitative easing, it wasn't just the developed countries uh, as they were adjusting to the global financial crisis. Uh, we also took part in it as developing countries uh, because credit uh, was quite low cost. We borrowed, but this time we are borrowing short in terms of maturity and pretty high cost, which presents its own set of, uh, of, uh, of problems. Uh, with the advent of the QE, the first challenge is that uh, rolling over this debt now has become much more expensive. We borrowed typically when it was five, six, seven percent. Uh, as we roll over now, when they mature fairly quickly, we are doing it at eight, nine, ten percent. And for some countries, this is already uh, proving way beyond whatever that they can manage. Uh, uh, I hear of countries that are, are already uh, having their airports, their railways uh, at ransom because the contracts for those debts typically had put these as collateral. And this is quite serious. It's uh, the type of issue uh, now that I don't have to take care of uh, uh, central banking again that uh, I've avoided now, but uh, my colleagues, some of them are here, I think they have got to deal with that particular uh, problem. Not only is the rollover cost rising, also there are bullet payments that need to be made. Uh, and very often, nobody has thought about uh, uh, putting uh, a sinking fund in advance. Uh, so that they can actually handle those bullet payments. But it is now advisable that everybody looks at the profile uh, in, in relation to uh, when that debt falls due. Uh, a related problem is what we call as a maturity mismatch. A good number of uh, our major projects that are funded with short-term credit are actually still under construction when you actually have to start repayment. So you don't have a revenue stream flowing from the investment, and yet you have to look for sources now, grabbing from other uh, possible sources, yes, uh, in order to be able to cover uh, that uh, repayment. This is a solvency challenge, uh, and it is uh, an important challenge uh, that 
again, we need uh, to, to address. And the last uh, characteristic of this debt profile now is what we call as currency mismatch. We have gone very big in terms of investment in infrastructure. These are non-tradables. They don't directly yield foreign exchange, but they're funded with borrowed funds that have to be serviced in foreign exchange. So there is also a liquidity challenge that countries have got to deal with. Now, I thought of uh, highlighting uh, both these new aspects of uh, the debt challenge so that it's not just whether the DSA, uh, the debt sustainability analysis tells you you are okay. You have got to look at first the debt dynamics and it is true that for majority, 17 out of uh, the 45, uh, 18 out of 45 countries actually have real interest rates in Africa, have real interest rates that exceed real growth. This means your debt to GDP ratio is certainly going on a trend uh, of worsening. So we have got to look at debt dynamics, and then we have got to look at the structural characteristics of the debt, both in terms of maturity and also in terms of currency. Thank you.